We cannot take a look at theories of organizations without considering systems theory. Systems theory is what's known as a ground theory, meaning that it's trying to explain the big processes of how we organize and what factors in general help to explain why we do the things that we do. It emerged in response to the need to make sense of organized complexity all across natural contexts, so it draws in concepts and metaphors from the life sciences in particular. And it focuses on understandings of wholeness, relationships, patterns, processes, and context. It emerged as a scientific framework after World War II. Ludwig van Bertenlaffe offered initially the general systems theory, and then it was contributed to by Norbert Weine with cybernetics and Gregory Bates and Steps into the ecology of the mind. But it has influenced a lot of academic disciplines from biology to sociology to economics to organizational theory, management sciences, and much, much more. The goal of general systems theory is to develop broadly applicable concepts and principles. It's not so much interested in very specific fine relationships that only apply to one domain of knowledge. That's why it's called this grand theory. So what it tries to do is, is distinguish between dynamic or active systems and static or passive systems. Active systems are activities, structures, components that all interact to influence behaviors and outcomes of those processes. Passive systems are structures and components that are being acted on or being processed. So the system's view is based on several fundamental ideas. First is that all phenomena can be viewed in a web of relationships among elements or this notion of a system. Second, all systems, whether electrical, biological, or social, have common patterns, behaviors, and properties that we can observe and analyze and develop greater insight into the behavior of these complex phenomena, so we move towards more of a unified view of the sciences and those kinds of interactions. Systems theory is an approach to organizations that likens the enterprise um, or the organization to an organism with interdependent parts. Each has its own function and they're all interrelated, but they all have this common set of responsibilities to the whole. So the system may be the whole organization, a division or a department or team, but whether the whole or a part, it's important that in, from a systems perspective, that the organizational actor and that the practitioner understand how the system operates and the relationship between the parts of the organization. In a lot of ways, when we're thinking about the organization as a system, we can think of systems theory as a generative map. It tells us how the parts relate and what each of the parts contributes. So the emphasis in organizational studies is that real systems are open to and interact with their environments. So it's possible that they can acquire new properties through those interactions. And that results in a continual evolution of the organization. So rather than reducing the organization to the properties of its parts or elements, what systems theory tries to do is focus on how those parts are arranged and what is the relationship between those parts, whether purely internal or internal with external, and that connects that to the whole. So systems theory identifies five characteristics of organizations and systems. The first is that the organization is an open system which interacts with the environment and is continually adapting and improving. Second, the organization influences and is influenced by its environment, the world in which it operates. Third, if an organization is to be effective, it has to pay attention to both the internal and external environments and then take steps to adjust itself to accommodate the changes in order to remain relevant. Fourth, all the parts of the organization are interconnected and interdependent. If one part of the system is affected, all parts are. And finally, it's not actually possible to know everything about the system. 
but if you look hard enough, there are certainly plenty of clues that give us an idea about the trajectories and impact of it. So systems theory is a way for understanding organizations or collectives of people based on several simple principles. First, relationships. Second, wholeness or big picture. Third, patterns. Fourth, complexity. Fifth, change. Sixth, interconnections. And seventh, contexts. So the core assumption is that any system, including organizations, is dynamic, pluralistic, and interdependent. The goal is to center organizational life within the living world and recognize that organizations are actually themselves living systems that are embedded in multiple contexts. All of them are dynamic, complex, and emergent. So if we think about what systems theory does is it reflects on who we are and, and in a lot of ways the smallness of our organizations within this broader global context. With all of this in mind, let's take a look at systems theory and the characteristics of living systems as a way to try and better understand the implications and, and these concepts of interrelatedness and so on. So systems theory first takes a look at organized wholes. It lets us distinguish between a collection of people versus an organization or community. The two are not synonymous. I mean, if you want to think about your closet, if you just pile a whole bunch of stuff in a closet, that's not really an organized system. However, if you've taken the time to put things where they belong, to have a reason and purpose for where everything is, that's an organization. So it's not just about a whole bunch of people interacting in a similar geographic location. So what systems theory argues is that an organization is fundamentally an arrangement of relationships whose goals are met from interactions among the members. A second characteristic of a living system is that it is self-stabilizing. What this means in terms of organizations is that systems theory argues that the purpose of the system is to help people cope with changes in the environment or uncertainty, which is something that we've talked about before. It argues then that systems serve three essential functions. First, they perform maintenance in response to changes in the environment. Second, it helps people cope with negative feedback. And third, the system in and of itself desires homeostasis. Think of homeostasis like your thermostat. The goal is to maintain a consistent temperature. So you don't want radical swings one way or another in the way that an organization performs or acts because that puts things out of kilter. Keep it consistent. And so this is what the self-stabilizing mechanism of systems theory argues in terms of the functions that organizations play. A third characteristic of living systems is that they are self-creating. In organizations, then, systems theory says that organizations themselves are self-creating and think of self-creating more like innovation. So as such, systems are able to first have a high capacity for innovation and creativity in response to environmental stimuli. Necessity is the mother of invention, in other words. Second, the organizations themselves are able to balance feedback, both positive and negative, again, to maintain that homeostasis, but also to adapt to its environment, which means that third, the organization and the system of the organization itself is emergent and adaptive. Organizations will change based on the needs around the environment. A fourth characteristic of living systems is that they tend to be nested hierarchically. Now, if you think about this in terms of what's the most typical, it never accounts for the exceptions to the rule and the colorful bits in between. But if we think about it, how, say, men's and women's clothes are organized, you might start by separating out what basic types of clothing we could see for men and for women. So for men, you might separate it down into suits and then in, from suits into slacks and jackets. 
So for women, you could sh separate it into dresses, categories of dresses, skirts and blouses. Now, of course, there are lots of ways to mix and match, and it doesn't necessarily mean that only men and only women wear those, but what the nested hierarchy is trying to do is to trying to come up with the most typical and logical way to organize categories and subcategories. Now, if we apply this to organizations, it means that there are first levels of complexity that may not have a lot to do with, with the explicit indications of rank or worth. So compare that to say a traditional organizational chart, but that within that, that organizational chart, that complexity can be quite rich. Second, there can be systems within systems. So you may have the system of a team nested within a department, nested within a group, nested within an organization. And even that organization may have branches all over the world. So systems within systems. And third, context matters for negotiating the organizational environment. So it's figuring out who's really important. So what person or persons can navigate between these different nests and these systems within systems. So this nested hierarchy gives us an idea for how organizations are categorized, but also what's required to effectively move between and manage the relationships within and between them. The final characteristic of a living system and also one that helps to distinguish it from just collections is that they are purposeful. So within an organizational context, the organization as a system suggests that first, there is a reason for the organization to exist. If that reason didn't exist, then the organization probably wouldn't. Second, the system itself defines both identity and boundary, that is what is and isn't included within the organization. Third, it provides the property of the system. It defines the rules for how the organization is run and, and what the organization is about. Fourth, it also provides the blueprint for how the system is supposed to work. If you think about how the organization is designed, its actual organizational structure, it, the ways that it navigates the, the routines, the communication interactions, the relationships between colleagues, their bosses, what have you, that's part of the blueprint. Now, assuming that this is written down, and of course there are a lot of elements of an organization that aren't written down, but to the extent that there are specific and enumerated designs for how all of this works, that's what we're talking about with the blueprint. And finally, that if we wanna think about it, really a system is a living thing. It's not a mechanism. It's not something that has gears and it's gonna run the same way every time because it's based on relationships and the challenges of negotiating complex environments. That's why it, it doesn't really use a machine metaphor. It uses this biologic metaphor to organize itself. There's purpose, but there's also a little bit of chaos in there. An example of how systems theory is applied in organizational settings is through relational pluralism. This is also a theory, but it's an example of a systems theory approach. And so relational pluralism is defined as when actors maintain multiple kinds of relationships with one another and develop multiple identities as a result. So research over the years has shown that relational pluralism in organizations can improve the flexibility of network ties, create more stable relationships, and improve innovation adoption. What this means in quite practical terms is that if we develop identities with our work group, so we share a strong level of connection, maybe personal relationships outside of work, maybe an identity, more importantly, mm -hmm. as we belong to this specific work group, that doesn't lessen the tie that we may feel to our department or to our organization overall. And in fact, what relational pluralism means is that the more that we identify with our team, with our department, with our organization, means that we're much more likely to innovate, take risk, 
and overall create a much more interesting organizational environment that solves problems more effectively. Now, over the years, relational pluralism and other systems theory approaches, when they've been applied in organizational settings, show some pretty significant um, positive outcomes for organizations if they understand an organization as a system. So, for example, uh, the use of mixed groups has been used as a systems theory approach to achieve a better understanding of how change is seen from different perspectives. So when organizations are going through changes, they can look at how the different kinds of, of groups might be tasked, and they've found that the actual suggestions and adoption of the change is much more effective. Other findings show, for example, that you can generate a holistic view. This kind of multiple levels of connection can generate a holistic view of what must be done to give the organization a secure future. Um, you can use diagnostic events to enhance people's understanding of important interdependencies and so support them in helping the organization to move forward. These processes over time have been shown that if you take this pluralism approach, that they increase collaboration between units, that it improves the quality of the relationship between groups, reduces competition, but more importantly, it helps to stimulate ideas for the organization to manage the issues both internally and externally more effectively. So what this helps for the organization to do, and the research shows pretty clearly, is that it ensures, allows the organization to ensure that it is externally sensitive and not isolated in its perspective. In all, a systems theory approach and the research supporting it shows that it helps the leadership team to understand what information they need, rely on their members, rely on the interconnections, and deal with their external environments much more effectively.